Hi guys and welcome back to Mind the Bat Chat, episode 9 today and it's a special occasion because we have our first ever guest and we'd like to introduce the man, the myth, the Vice President of the Institute of Osteopathy, Dan Collis. Hello George and Gus, thank you very much for having me, I'm really excited to be joining you here today. Ah, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here, honestly we've been trying to get a guest in for a while and I'm glad it's you to be fair. I'm very honoured to be the first one, thank you so much. So I think, you know what, let's give it a little bit, a bit of a start. Who are you? So, um, as George said, my name's Dan Collis. I am an osteopath. I actually trained with George at the European School of Osteopathy. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I graduated in 2019, and since then I've been working across Cambridge and North London. George and I have been good friends for quite a long time. We did a lot of sport together at university. We both now live in Cambridge. We have a little sort of dynasty of osteopaths in Cambridge, which is good fun. Um, and yeah, now I, as alongside my clinical work, I'm also involved with the Institute of Osteopathy, and I'm currently vice president, which is a big honour. It means I get to represent osteopaths in terms of talking to the NHS, talking to the local government, and trying to really advance the profession from that sort of level. So. I know, because I know you, that you're probably one of the busiest people I've ever met in my life, and being the Vice President is something that's just come on. First of all, my first question is, what got you into osteopathy? What's your story? Because the viewers know mine and Gab's, but also what other stuff do you do on the side? Because I know you like, do a little bit with the reserves as well in the army, so come on down, a man of many tales. <laughs> sure, so I think you've oversold me there a little bit. But, um... Yes, yeah, so I got into osteopathy originally because of my nan. She was suffering with really bad neck and shoulder pain, and the local physio, doctor, surgeon wasn't really helping. She was put on all sorts of pills, and was really getting her down, decreasing her enjoyment of life, it was restricting what she could do. And then one day she went to an osteopath, and you know he didn't use any medication. He worked naturally and holistically with her body, and got her better in about two sessions, I think. And Mental. so I went to observe him one day and I just thought this looks amazing you know great work-life balance the guy really seemed to enjoy his life he was helping patients in a very sort of holistic natural way which was important to me I didn't really I'm a big fan of pharmaceutical aid when it's needed but I think it's potentially over prescribed in our modern society and I think osteopathy is a nice mix of really highlighting how the body can heal in a natural non-medicinal way and I'm a big proponent of that so I think that leads on to the question really of being Vice President of the IO, what are your plans to really try and implement these kind of interests towards naturopathy in, in that sense? Well, so I don't actually know too much about naturopathy as such. I said at the European School of Osteopathy, we didn't really get too much training in that regard. But what I would say is at the IA, what we're trying to do is increase the sort of representation of osteopaths in the national healthcare market so that we can decrease you know the surgeon waiting list so we can get people not needing surgery as often so we can get people back into work when they're missing work because of musculoskeletal weights and pains and i want to see the full breadth of osteopathy being utilized to improve the healthcare of the nation and that's what we're pushing whether that's getting more osteopaths working in the nhs and sort of various different units or whether that's expanding private practice to reach those who don't normally access osteopathy and you know from elite sport to working with actors to working with the general public I think we just want to see osteopathy being utilised and more widely known amongst the public because at the moment in the UK about 2% of the population have utilised an osteopath, 10% of the population know about an osteopath which isn't great numbers and I am passionate about osteopathy and I want I want 90%, I want 95%. That's why we have you here today, yeah. Jack. Yeah. We're all passionate about exactly. it. Exactly, and I love it, and that's why I'm here too. Because I just think osteopathy has so much to offer, and I think it's a real shame that not so many people know about us and what we can do. For sure. I mean, I was quite lucky to have a, a stint of working on the NHS, but that was mm. still private NHS work, so we yes. were getting paid by the NHS, and it's, a, it's, a, it's quite different because it's a lot of letter writing, it's a lot more pressure in a way mm. you don't get as long. To see patients but it feels like especially due to the pandemic we've been pushed more in that direction seeing as healthcare professionals do you see that changing more soon or do you think it's going to take a little bit more time or what kind of things are necessary to enable that change do you mm. think sure so that's that's a really interesting point and the healthcare market has adapted and changed a lot since covid and we've seen at the moment where there's huge waiting lists and demands being placed on the nhs 
and it's underfunded, understaffed, that more and more people are choosing private healthcare, which is sad, but it is a benefit to osteopaths working in private practice because it means we're seeing people who we wouldn't normally see and we have a chance to help them and improve their lives and show them the wonderful work of osteopathy. Um, so I think that trend will probably continue for the next few years in terms of the NHS not really being able to fix its sort of waiting list problems at the moment. It doesn't seem to be a particularly rosy picture at the moment, which is potentially going to mean that osteopaths in private practice will continue to be busy. But it also means that there's more and more opportunities for osteopaths to work directly within the NHS if they want to do that. At the IA, we're very big proponents of accessibility and opportunities. We want osteopaths to have the opportunity to work in the NHS if they want to, but if they want a successful private practice career like you're both in, then we want to support that as well. So for instance, about a couple of years ago, it was very, very rare for any NHS job opportunity to mention the word osteopath. They would say physio, but they would not mention osteopath. Now there's about 100 job listings per month specifically why, why do you think that? Why, why do you think that? Because, I mean, in my opinion, the reason why we have been very much lacking in that aspect to do with the NHS is purely based off of um, the sort of misunderstanding that there is a huge lack of uh, factual evidence behind the treatment uh, using osteopathy for different pathologies. However, we're finding that more and more osteopathy does have a great deal of evidence, but there's been a huge lack of um, advancements and development bef uh, behind recognition within the NHS. Do you feel as though we're soon going to see huge advancements in this, or do you think that actually it's going to take a long while just because of, I wouldn't want to call it a, a stigma, but a lack of understanding behind of what we're capable of? Mm. Yeah, no, that's a really good question, Gavs, and, and it's a tricky one because, like you say, there is more and more evidence out there to suggest that osteopathy is incredibly effective at dealing with many conditions. Part of the problem is, is that the NHS really likes randomised control trials, and we don't have quite so many studies of that for osteopathy. We have more qualitative studies. And could you explain, just for the viewers out there sure. who maybe don't know what an RCT is, randomised control trial, what is exactly all of these? Sure. Just, just giving a bit of The bane of my life during my <laughs> uh, dissertation, my <laughs> gosh. My one was a systemic review, so it's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. Randomised control trials are the sort of gold standard of clinical trials. So effectively, a random example could be if you're looking to investigate the effectiveness of a new drug, you would compare it to a placebo, so a, say a pill coated in sugar, you know, that's not actually doing anything. So what you'd do is you'd get a thousand participants, you'd have 500 of them taking the, the pill and 500 taking the placebo. And you'd take control of various measurables, so you'd have the same amount of women and men, and you would have make sure that you can control the variables as much as possible, so there'd be similar age, similar genders, similar health conditions. No one person knows which pills which, obviously. Exactly, so yeah. Even and the practitioner who's looking after them. Exactly, yeah, so that's what's called a double-blinded study, so the participants and the people giving out the medication don't know which is which, so there's no inherent bias in that sort of belief system of, of what they're getting. So that, that's a randomised control trial, which is easy to do in the pharmaceutical industry because you have two different pills. What's really hard to do is applying it to any sort of manual therapy because say you and I, George, run a randomised control trial investigating, say, a uh, massage technique of, of the elbow and you treat 500 people's elbows in a sort of non-specific way, so you're not doing an osteopathic technique, you're just randomly touching the elbow and I'm doing an osteopathic technique you can't really control the variables because a lot of osteopathy is, is touch and touch is very healing and so a lot of the people that you would treat in that sort of non-specific, non-osteopathic way would probably still get better and, and that's a brilliant thing because placebo is a brilliant oh, thing. It's so powerful. Yeah, and it has lots of results and so it makes it really hard to compare the effectiveness of that with say me doing another technique and the problem with that as well is, you know, we talked briefly about blinding in terms of the person giving the care being blinded. Now, you, we can't blind each other. I'm going to have to be told. It would be great to watch on TV. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do yeah. Because yeah. I think mean, there's blind physios, though. No, you're true. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by blind, <laughs> <physio. laughs> not visual blindness, <laughs> just to clarify. Usual. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's part of the problem. But 
the, the other issue with the NHS is it's an incredibly devolved administration. So when we think of the NHS, we like to think of it as one big, huge institution across the UK. It's not, you know, you've got NHS England, NHS Scotland, Wales, etc. But then within that, you've got NHS trusts. Now, each NHS trust can view osteopathy in a very different light. So some NHS trusts are very reasonable and very forward-thinking and progressive and will love osteopaths and recognise what we can do, recognise the massive benefits we can have for the patient population. Other trusts could not be so up-to-date with the latest research or could have negative biases towards osteopaths and they may prevent osteopaths from, work from working in those trusts. So the IA takes an approach of talking to many, many, many trusts across the UK, trying to inform all of them about the evidence that's out there to support osteopathy and to make those jobs available to us. So we've kind of spoken around um, your profession a little bit within being a vice president of, uh, of the IO. Can we hear a little bit of what you are like as a practitioner, you know, what are your interests? What do you enjoy sort of seeing in clinic? What makes Dan the Dan. osteopath? <laughs> what makes Mr. Collis the osteopath? <laughs> That's a very good question. So I'm quite a sporty person. I've done a triathlon with George. I do, yeah. <laughs> I do a lot of running, I do a lot of gym work. Um, so I'm very big on sports. I've noticed the games. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very big on sports and rehabilitation. So linking into that as, and how that affects me as a practitioner is that I'm all about patient empowerment. So if a patient comes to me and say they have hip pain and you know they're late in their sixties and maybe they have a little bit of hip arthritis, some old school GPs or practitioners may look at that and say, I don't want you ever running again and I want you to stop doing your hobbies. That's the total opposite view I tend to take. I want to get them back doing their activities that they love. I want to get them feeling strong, get them feeling healthy and confident as soon as possible. So the approach I tend to take within that is treating the symptoms to decrease their pain levels and inflammation, building their confidence up through sort of progressive exercises that start off fairly gentle that are within their pain ranges, building up that load that the muscles and joints and tendons can tolerate until we get to a point where they're doing the things they want to be doing, whether that's squats, whether that's picking up their grandchildren, going on cycles, uh, wherever they want to get to. So I like the combination of osteopathy and the hands-on treatment alongside structured rehabilitation plan to get them to where they want to go. It's a very personalised approach to your patients. Exactly. Which I think is always important as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going and that's the other great thing that we have as osteopaths is we have the time mm. to really dive deep into what the patient's presenting with and like what are your goals and a lot of times people are just like, I just want to get back to playing tennis, I just want yeah. to get back to doing this. And as you said, like if you're told like, oh you're not gonna be able to do that, it doesn't really inspire you to try and get better. Mm. So I think it's a really powerful tool to use is what do you want to do? Yeah. Let's let's try and aim for that as a goal. Obviously not making any promises, mm -hmm. but with rehabilitation and the right approach, a lot's possible. But then that goes into sort of um, the amazing and wonderful philosophy behind osteopathy being holism. Mm -hmm. You know, we believe that everything that encompasses you as an individual and the structure that creates your uh, human body essentially is a dictation behind what occurs within your physiology as well and how you develop and break down as well so that's again it's how can we work with that in order to give you the best possible vitality and agency to achieve what you want to achieve mm, I love that and that I think leads on to one of the topics we may be discussing today which is breathing and, and if I know this man right here this guy knows his breathing <laughs> <laughs> I am known to talk about breathing an awful lot what are those uh, uh, exercises you did every day I was five Tibetan rights yeah you're talking about your Tibetan rights oh uh, gosh so <laughs> so this links into what I want to talk about in a bit which is this book called Breath by James Nestor can't recommend it enough it's quite literally changed the way I live my life and he, in that book he mentions these things called the five Tibetan rites, which the Tibetan monks to this day and thousands of years do. And it's five fairly simple movements, I can't really describe them very well, but effectively you do 21 of these movements every day and it's got benefits like improving your posture, improving your respiratory, your, your breath work and particularly the mobility around the thoracic spine, your mid-back and your ribs. So as, I, as I remember, I did them with you quite a bit of core work as well. Yeah, exactly, which feeds into the sort of postural control and breathing capacity. 
and these monks do do these movements every day and you know you look at their postures when they're in their 80s their 90s and the, the amount of control they have over their breathing you know, it's incredible how long does it take not very long so you do 21 reps of each exercise and no one knows quite why you do 21 there's certain theories one of the theories is that in eastern philosophy they believe that the soul weighs roughly 21 grams so that's one of the theories why you do 21 not everyone can start off with 21 of these exercises it is actually a bit of a workout so you can start off with like three of each build it up to five seven etc yeah I, I remember doing them and yeah it doesn't take long at all five ten mm. minutes max uh just whack it out first thing in the morning it just kind of wakes you up for the day as Absolutely. well it's quite a smooth way of getting into it and uh yeah again easy to find the time to do it yeah, yeah. and I, I do the exercises in the gym as my warm-up and one of the exercises, the first one, is you know, sort of arms are outstretched and he's effectively just spin around in a circle. Um, <laughs> more like Yeah, more like Oh, like, really? Like that, yeah. oh. And people, PTs in the gym are always staring at me. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, it's got nothing to do with the exercises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just always saying that to me too. Are, are you sure you don't need a PT, my G? <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, this, guy, this guy doesn't have to give weights, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's good. Um, so yeah. You've read the book about breath. Mm. What were like the key things that you've taken away that, that maybe you give to your patients on a regular basis? Oh, that's a good question, and it's not a short answer, I'm afraid. So, no. so what, <laughs> I, what I start off with is one of the benefits that changing the way I breathe has, has meant to me. So, I used to get really quite bad hay fever seasonally, for, and I'd have to take um, antihistamines probably for about three to four weeks every year, typically around June, July sort of time. It'd be really bad, I'd be sneezing a lot, my eyes would be really irritated, I'd be fatigued. I didn't really like taking the antihistamines at all, it was sort of like a last resort, but I'd have to take it for three to four weeks. This last year, so I read the book in about January last year, and I changed the way that I breathed. And then in the summer, I did I had I had hay fever, but it was nowhere near as bad. I think I took one antihistamine throughout the whole summer because I'd improved the way I breathed so much that it meant that I wasn't getting hay fever so much. Wow. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and so that then leads on to, so in terms of what... Uh, how, how, how deep does this rabbit hole go? Yeah, it is quite deep. So <laughs> one of the things I want to talk about breathing is, you know, we don't tend to think about breathing, right? It's subconscious. We don't really think we can alter it that much. But breathing is what we call a sort of autonomic nervous system activity. So the autonomic nervous system is the things that happen when we're sub in our subconscious. So you have two different states, you have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So the parasympathetic is the sort of rest and digest. It's you're slowing down, it's that feeling after lunch of all the blood flow going to your belly, your muscles are relaxing, you're digesting food, you're nice and relaxed. Then you have the opposite, which is the sympathetic, which is the sort of fight or flight. It's the blood flow is going to your muscles, your pupils are dilating, you're ready for a fight, you're ready to run away. This is the sort of system that Evolutionary was designed for us to get out of a sticky situation, get run away from a lion, a tooth tiger, yeah, yeah, or fight something. A machete. Yeah, well, <laughs> a machete. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, so with that, we tend to think that we can't really access our sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system, but it turns out that we can. And one of the best ways you can activate your parasympathetic nervous system is through breathing. And now you might be wondering why would I want to activate this parasympathetic nervous system? But the way humans live our modern lives is that we're a lot of chronically stressed people, people with chronic fatigue, people who are just go, 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 people who suffer with burnout, tend to be really sympathetically driven. Mm. They're very stressed. They're, and you, it's bad to be in that sympathetic nervous system state for a long period of time because it's detrimental to the body. Things start not working because we're only meant to be in that for a short space of time. Well, as you said, it takes blood flow away from the internal the digestive organs, 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 yeah. Exactly, so. so you're not recovering as well, you're not sleeping as well, your heart rate remains elevated. So it leads to a whole host of problems. Now, occasionally with people who are too sympathetically driven, what happens is they don't know how to switch to that parasympathetic side because they're mutually exclusive. You can't be fully sympathetic and have a parasympathetic outcome at the same time. But what then happens is, you really want the parasympathetic activity because that means you relax, it means your heart rate drops down, you get the happy hormones, everything's flowing nicely. So there's certain breathing techniques you can do to actually stimulate both the sympathetic or the parasympathetic. Now you might be wondering, why would you want to stimulate the sympathetic nervous mm. system? 
But what's really handy is, and if I use the metaphor of a sort of constantly running tap, and this tap is running at quite a low level, and this, this low level tap is representing your sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. So constantly go, 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 go. And you just can't turn it off. But you want to turn it off to get to the parasympathetic, as if there's like a cold in the hot. You can't start the hot until you turn off the cold. But you can't turn off the cold. And what the, what the sympathetic breathing mechanism you can do, which is called the Wim Hof method, that's one of the various methods to stimulate sympathetic activity, means that your body gets better control of the taps. It knows how to fully turn the sympathetic on. So instead of a sort of steady dribble on that tap, you get the full blast of it, and your body recognises, ah, this is what the sympathetic nervous system is meant to do. Right. And then because you learn to get fully in on that sympathetic, the body responds and recognises, and now I can activate the parasympathetic because it's that sort of antagonistic pair. If you can get one fully activated, it's much easier to allow the other to activate. So would you say you're at that point now that you can, you've almost got them activating that way? Yeah, so I, I regularly do various breathing practices. So like I mentioned, one of the Wim Hof breathing practices you can do is you do effectively 30 rapid exhales so when you do this breathing yeah a bit like that so what you're really focusing on is deep diaphragmatic exhales so you're pushing all the breath out of your body and go so the inhale you're not focusing on the inhale you're just purely focusing on exhaling you do that 30 times then you breathe everything out you hold it for as long as you can then you take a really big inhale and then you repeat that three times. Now you only do this when you're sat down in a comfortable environment, you don't do it whilst you're driving or you're walking. <laughs> or on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, because you can get quite dizzy from this, you can You can really out. feel it in the diaphragm. Exactly. I just did it a very short one then, and I can feel it, like, really squeezing. You're not injured already, to it. Ah, shoulders. Oh, <laughs> I yeah, please, let's not go into that. <laughs> so, let's not go into that, but I'm gonna go into something else. Um, right now we have a little bit of a, it, it, it's an ongoing, I'm, I'm going to call it an endemic in a sense, mm. and it's called chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm. Um, now, one of the current sort of bits of research behind chronic fatigue syndrome is that actually you are in that constant state of a sympathetic tone, but it's pretty much low level, mm. uncontrolled, and you're not able to switch between one and another. So you're constantly using ATP for energy and what tends to happen is because you're always using that, you start to switch from one system, which is the ATP system, to another one, which I, I for the life of me, I've been trying to think what it's called for the past five minutes. <laughs> um, CTP, BTP, something along those lines. Mm. It's a system that's slightly different to ATP. ATP can get recovered after 30 seconds, is which... It Maybe DTP. I think it's DTP. So, yeah. So a ADP, adenosine, but that's, that's, that's when it's, that's when it's yeah. being used. That's yes. when it's been used. So there's, there's, another, another there's a different system, completely different mm. system, which takes uh, between five to seven days to recover. Right. So that's what happens with chronic fatigue syndrome is that actually you stop using ATP and you start using this other okay. system, which is why there are different phases in chronic fatigue syndrome being that actually um, you feel a lot better, you start integrating a bit of exercise and a bit of movement into it, mm -hmm. but because you haven't been able to access that ATP, as soon as you push that border and you've used up all of this other energy system, we're gonna call it, uh, what do you call it, DTP? Mm -hmm. We're gonna call it DTP. <laughs> no, 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 we're gonna, no. we're gonna fact check it. <laughs> Uh, you use up your DTP and then you crash mm. and that crash goes from absolutely zero energy for a couple of days and then in about five to seven days you've got a little bit of energy and you could start again mm. so how would you sort of feel as though that could have a potential effect into reaching into this sort of breathing method mm. and how you can treat chronic fatigue syndrome with this breathing method do you feel like there's a connection there so I, I can't speak about any direct links between breathing techniques and improvement in chronic fatigue symptoms because I, I just don't, haven't really studied that. But in general, I'd say some of the symptoms associated with chronic fatigue, say poor quality sleep, bad nutrition, high blood pressure, things like that, 
could potentially be improved through different breathing techniques. Now, one of the best tips I would say about breathing is so many of us, about 40 to 50% of the population are chronic mouth breathers. Now, this is a bugbear of mine. <coughs> yeah. when, I see, when, I see, when I see people walking around in the street mouth breathing, I feel so bad for them and I also get annoyed because so many sort of Western illnesses are sort of exacerbated by mouth breathing. Now, you might be asking, you know, why, why is that? You know, from time to time, we all need to mouth breathe when we're running, when we're sprinting, or if you have a really blocked nose, but we are evolutionarily designed to nasal breathe. Now, the reason for that is when we breathe through our nose, the air gets heated, it gets moisturized, and it gets filtered. When you breathe through your mouth, none of that happens. So all sorts of pathogens go straight through, the air isn't heated, so it's, it produces more problems for the body and it's not moisturized. So what happens is a whole host of detrimental effects and we also have so many things. When we nasal breathe, you get an increase in nitric um, oxide, which is a beneficial hormone, which helps, I'm not sure if it's that hormone, but you have another hormone that helps regulate um, your heartbeat and your blood pressure, which you get when you nasal breathe, but you don't get when you breathe through your mouth. And that's interesting, sorry, because yeah. like when you're a baby, you cannot breathe through your mouth. Exactly, yeah. You can so, only breathe through your nose, so it's, it's a learn yeah. fault. So there's a really interesting, so if you, there's studies that have looked at um, Native Indian tribes and Native American tribes, and the mothers will force the baby's mouth shut pretty much 24 7. They will not let the babies breathe through the mouth. And what you see with these sort of indigenous tribes who have that ethos of purely nasal breathing is for starters, they get ill less often, they tend to be more fit, they tend to grow taller, their mouth formation tends to be better, their skull formation tends to be better, and there's been studies that have linked mouth breathing to poor jaw formation, dental problems, all sorts of issues. But also neurological disorders have been linked to nasal breathing. Because so nasal breathing. of, well, because of the nitric oxide absorption and how it sort of uh, allows for uh, neurons to develop a lot more further. I'm watching like a, an old Western standoff there. <laughs> Dan's so, like, oh, no, 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 no. with that, and then like, saying, Dan's like, you say nasal breathing doesn't work? <laughs> no, 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 that does, no, that no, does, no, no, no. that does help, that it does, does help. So you're saying it helps it neurological does, conditions? Yes, oh, yes, right. yes, Sorry, yes, I got, yes. I got the idea as well that you came in and said it causes. <laughs> no, 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 that, that helps, sorry, right, sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, no, that makes sense. Okay, let's start over. Nasal breathing <laughs> helps neurological development. There you go. Yeah. Well, like, someone like me, mm. when I was younger, I got kicked in the face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you can't just jump in with that, what the hell? I, I, I was playing football, I got kicked in the face, and I broke my nose, and I had to have it reset. Mm. But since then, I can't breathe out my right nostril, mm. or I can't take air in efficiently yeah. through my right nostril. And what I found is I have to breathe through my mouth now. Yeah. Unless I have obviously a corrective surgery to open up mm. the nostril, not everyone's open. Not everyone has accessibility to that. That's very true, and broken noses are terrible for that. What I would say is there are ways you can train to an extent to improve a nostril's capacity to breathe. It takes time and dedication, but there are ways to do it and to improve it. And I think if you ask me, I think it's worthwhile doing. I've heard you snore. <laughs> it would definitely be worthwhile. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Thanks. But no, I think. You that know, feels like a kick to the face. It's <laughs> happening all over. But no, you can't. You really can't. You can't overestimate the benefits of nasal breathing. There's mm. just so many. So, for instance, I trained myself for a half marathon to purely nasal breathe whilst I was running, and you also you lose less moisture when you're nasal breathing as well. So when I was doing this race, it was the most efficient run I've ever done. I had the best half marathon I've ever raced. I felt more calm, I felt under control, I didn't feel as fatigued, and I just had a brilliant race, and I nasal breathed the whole way through it, and it was brilliant. And so there's just so, so many benefits to nasal breathing, I really can't talk about it enough, but if you, ever, if you want to find out more, I would really recommend this book, Breath, by James Nestor. And then coming into that about the running, yeah. um, for me anyway, if I go, if when I play football in the cold weather, mm. and I take air in yeah. through my mouth, I start to develop you know, sounds lovely, phlegm, yeah, no, because I get uh, irritation, the yeah. trachea. So it's causing discomfort, mm, yeah. it's causing my breathing to change because of course you're able to get less air in. Um, 
So obviously nasal breathing is there to yes warm the air, mm. so it doesn't irritate yeah. the internal surfaces as much. So yeah, and so one of the ways if you want to improve your capacity to to nasal breathe, it is quite a tough thing. You know, sometimes you're walking fast and you get out of breath, and so one of the ways you practice with that is you know first you do it with fast walking and you force yourself to only nasal breathe. The Spartans actually had a really great. Um, so basically lots of cultures have really recognised nasal breathing as incredibly important, particularly so in Eastern philosophies. We sort of sort of forgotten about it in the West, which is a terrible shame. I think it's probably linked with things like rises in asthma and dermatological conditions that are linked with those sorts of things. So the Spartans, what they used to do is they would drink and hold a gulp of water in their mouth and then they would run miles and miles and miles and then at the end they'd have to spit out this water and if they didn't spit out enough water they'd get whipped and effectively what it trains you to do is and if you can try this you, know, you can walk around town i remember you telling back. me about this i don't fancy yeah so, so what you do is you just have the gulp of water and you run and it forces you to nasal breathe do not swallow the water after like five minutes it tastes disgusting do you spit it out but it's a really good way of training yourself to nasal breathe and you recognize oh my gosh yeah this is harder than i thought maybe i have been mouth breathing more than i thought i was and you start to train yourself to become more efficient in that walking, more efficient in your respiration, and everything just starts to work better. Hey Alexa, add whip to my shopping list. <laughs> just, just in case you see people <laughs> running around town, it's like, spit out the water. <laughs> okay, ah, oh, nice. So I think that's a really good introduction to how breathing can be fantastic. Mm. And do you use that quite regularly with your patients then? Do you go through these tips? Or? Yeah, so, on a more practical level, I guess, one other thing I'd like to mention is, so when we're quite sympathetically driven, we tend to use what's called our accessory respiratory muscles. Now these are muscles in the sort of upper ribs that go into your neck, and they're called accessory breathing muscles because they're not your primary breathing muscles. Mm. So your primary respiratory muscle is your diaphragm and your belly. So what you want to see is big belly movements when you're breathing. But if you don't, if you see your shoulders really head hunched up, you're probably overusing your accessory breathing muscles. So that can lead to neck pain, it can lead to shoulder pain, and a whole host of problems. And you can fix that by switching your breathing, and switching to more diaphragmatic breathing, which will then also have added benefits of activating your parasympathetics, calming you down, making you more relaxed. And so that's probably the most common one I talk about, is really getting patients to switch to diaphragmatic breathing, to reduce that tension in the neck and the shoulders, and to help with stress. And then, yeah, moving on to the more advanced stuff, like talking about how to manipulate the parasympathetic and sympathetic system with the Wim Hof breathing and, and the nasal breathing at that slightly more advanced level. So that's interesting because, um, you know, when we're looking at breathing and the, the different host of problems that comes with that, because when you're looking at accessory muscles to breathing, you're also including the scalenes. Mm. So one of the biggest kind of things that we know about scalenes is how they sort of um, entwine themselves around the brachial plexus. So what would that sort of Which mean? Which are the nerves exiting your neck. Yeah, exiting the neck and going down into the arms. So when you are looking at people who work in desks, offices, things like that, you're going to be using a lot of your accessory muscles to breathing, mainly because of the kyphotic posture that a lot of people will adopt. And then in turn with that, you're going to be using different muscles, you're going to be creating these muscles to have extra tension and then pushing onto nerves and then you go to sleep and you find yourselves waking up with absolutely terrible pins and needles, numbness and pain in your arms. You know, a little bit of food for thought. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so... And, and that is really common, waking up that pins and needles sensation and part of that is that fatigue and the muscles, like you mentioned, like around the scalenes, which are close to the nerves that exit the neck and supply the arms. And yeah, if you're constantly tense with the shoulders, if you're constantly breathing quite shallow, rapid breaths and hunching the shoulders, then that will really affect it. And I think that's why with a lot of patients, if um, they do come in with kind of some form of neck or shoulder discomfort, much like that thoracic outlet syndrome as well, that kind of question in your head comes in, like, is there any stress playing a role mm. into this as well? That's, yeah, fatiguing the muscle, as you said, making it tighter. Um, right, well, I think that's been fantastic. I can't thank you enough for coming onto the podcast. I think it's been fantastic, and I think we've learned a lot today. And I uh, also had a good laugh as well. <laughs> oh, thank you very much for having me. 
I think the best message out of this is I'm definitely going to start breathing from my nose. Oh, for sure. <laughs> but as always, as me and Gab's always finish, we say ciao for now. Do you want to have a special... Ciao for now is my say. I think you stole that from me. Oh, uh, uh, you know what right? now. <laughs> if, if anything, it, I, it's no, actually, I started that. No. Goodbye. Ciao for now. <laughs>